properly construed as a set of activities, as a set of intellectual problems, is extraordinarily stimulating, uh, both uh, stimulating educationally and stimulating culturally. This last uh, panel session, uh, formal panel session, is devoted uh, to the question of education broadly construed. Uh, I won't say anything about it because the panel and the moderator have much to say. The uh, moderator is Karl Deutsch, uh, whom I think everybody knows has had a long and very distinguished career associated with space activities in multivarious forms, uh, leadership in the Canadian program in robotic and human exploration as president of the International Space University and now as uh, chairman of uh, the, uh, it's the Athena Global uh, does market intelligence and consulting for strategies. Uh, it be a pleasure to listen. Thank you. Well, thank you for that in introduction, and um, welcome to the final session, which has as a theme education. If I look at space activity, it really has two bookends. One bookend is education, and the other bookend is outreach. And current space activity has a lot of momentum. But if those bookends go away, the momentum goes away. So we have to rely on those two ends of space activity to keep it going. When we want to grow, when we want to increase momentum, we have to have more funneling in through the education system. And if we want it to grow, we better have a good output which provides the support for space activity in the future. So whilst we've had two good days of detailed discussions of what's happening inside the space activity um, field, um, particularly from the biomedicine uh, point of view, we have to address the question of sustainability of the program and the growth of the program if some of the ideas of exploration that have been put forward are to become reality in a finite period of time. So recognizing the two ways I've um, characterized this aspect of education, the education itself, which is the formal part, which schools do, which universities do, and the outreach part, which is the part that a completely different set of actors um, normally are proficient in. I would like uh, the panelists to really uh, focus in the, these two sections and not everybody to speak on everything because we just don't have enough time. Um, but I'll start off with the education part, the formal part of the education. And um, I'll start off with Jim Tour, who is an educator at Rice University. And um, maybe you can address the question of education and its interface to space activity. Well, I think that uh, um, we have tremendous opportunities in education. And as an educator, one of the things that, that I think we have to do is we have to be motivators to excite our students. Uh, space is a, is a topic that uh, it's easy to get students excited in. Uh, I think that uh, uh, as an educator, the hard part these days is is uh, maintaining a graduate education program to allow people to go forward. And uh, I don't envy my young colleagues. Uh, I think it's extremely hard in the current funding environment to, uh, to provide for them uh, the opportunities that, that, uh, that they need. Uh, if you look at, for example, in biomedicine, uh, venture capital funding is down 85% since 2008. So if you talk about transitioning, it is very difficult to do this. And so what's happening is uh, our best students are seeking other, other positions and going other places. Uh, 
my best Chinese students are returning to China. They would normally have stayed here, but there are not the opportunities for them here in the United States. Uh, so they're going back to China, they're going back to Asia, or they're going back to Singapore, and that's what they're doing. And so we've already seen the brain drain is now upon us. The brain drain is happening. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, the very smart ones are e either going back to their home countries, going to other countries where they can do work, or what they're doing is uh, they're going into an industrial position when they would have preferred to go into an academic position, but they're just are not the jobs. Uh, my students, if they wanted an academic position, they would often have five, six, seven interviews. And now they might be fortunate enough to get one interview because people are just not hiring. So rather than just, just leaving it there, I, I, I'll just mention that a route to begin to be able to solve this might be <clears throat> if, if industry were to step up uh, in a way that they didn't traditionally do. I have the good fortune of being here in Houston and the oil companies are doing very well. Uh, and because oil prices have been high, my, but to give you an idea, personally, my research always used to be about 80 to 90 percent federally funded and about 10, at the most, 20 percent industrially funded. I'm now about 80 percent industrially funded, and that's a transition that's taken place in the last two and a half years, most of that from the oil industry. And then we deliver the things that they like, but we also do a lot of basic research, and I bleed off of that to do radiation studies for space, to do uh, 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 even, even things like nanoelectronics. Yes, there, there's money out there, but it's not like it used to be. So um, uh, my job is to keep my students and my group encouraged and to keep speaking positively in the face of uh, uh, these sort of crises. But uh, uh, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult, not just for space, but for every other field because of the, the tightening of, of resources. Thank you. Uh, Francesco, um, you just had the gauntlet thrown down to you as to industry and what industry can do. Are you getting the sort of products out of the university's sector that Boeing as a company needs, and can you help stimulate the education side? Well, I mean, in my day job, I'm a, a propulsion engineer for the Boeing company. Uh, the reason I'm here, though, is because I'm director for the Foundation of International Space Education. And what we're trying to do with that, we try to stimulate and uh, promote uh, both international cooperation and uh, STEM education into young uh, students because the, that's a general uh, approach to, to the education, the fact that people that's graduating now is finding, finding hard to find a job. And for me, I'm, I'm from Italy, and uh, we experienced that a long time ago. So our brain, uh, we call fuga di cervelli. That means people study in Italy because the education in Italy was really good, and then they were all leaving because there was not really a job there. And uh, now it's, 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 we start to experience something here as well. So, you know, study engineer uh, it's, or, you know, STEM in general, it's a hard study. And uh, so you go through a lot of pain you know, to go through, and you do that for passion. Uh, but at the end, if you see that there's no way to go and you start to see your brother or your older friends that finish education and cannot find a job, and maybe someone else that didn't go through all that education is, is working already and making twice or three times the money. Well, all is left there to continue to do that is, is your passion. So you have it or not. When I arrived to NASA, I noticed that it was great environment because you know working with people, you know, all very high level educated and engineer, and uh, you could realize the outside there, they could have had another job like in the old business, making like probably three times the money that you were making with the same education, but they were there, and they were there for a reason, for the passion. And I think that that's one thing that we need to continue to stimulate in order to, to get people to do that. On the other hand, we need to also try to promote and, 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 uh, and, and give them possibilities because you, know, you cannot have one without the other. But uh, uh, we are at a crucial point, and what we see uh, it's, I see that every country is kind of phasing. Uh, it's going in that path because we're kind of, so 
it's going through, I know the Christ and everything, but you know, right now, you mentioned China, but China right now, they have more possibility because there's company that is it's going up, but eventually that will get there if we don't, if we don't change things how they are. And so uh, it, it's good uh, to, to, to look at both sides. So the side of, you know, stimulate the, stimulate the, the passion people to go into this type of study because we need and many, many, Euro, nearly many universities are, are closing uh, entire department because they don't have enough students. And that's, so we're gonna have less engineer and in the future when then the job will come back, but then you cannot fill them with the people because now you don't have the people. So you'll have a, an opposite problem. So it's... Uh, are the skills which um, are being uh, developed in the universities as well as the knowledge, um, are they meeting what the uh, space sector needs? Anybody else like to pick that one up? We've talked uh, a lot about um, some of the interdisciplinary, uh, intercultural skills, teamwork skills and so on. Um, Carl, yeah. Carl, I'd take a shot at that. It, uh, NSBRI, you know, I work for Baylor as well as NSBRI, and we've developed a, a variety of programs, a portfolio of programs that we, we hope that we can uh, provide not only the academic foundation, but the, the, the social skills that are necessary for these young men and women to be successful in their environment. Uh, three of them are sitting up there right now, and you, I can assure you that you're all the cream of the crop. You're all going to find work one day. You're, it, it, the angst that's going through you, with the, the, right. the, the Jim correctly pointed out, if you, if you can find a job in the aerospace industry or the space industry, I'll hire you. So it's a, uh, so, so rest yeah. assured that you, the, it's a, so you you have something to look forward to. But there's the, it's not only is the experience of these students coming to uh, uh, conferences such as this one uh, to provide those growth experiences, Carl, that are so important for the young people, the networking skills that they've built. Uh, some of these young people are, are more, uh, so more, more sophisticated. Uh, Jim, uh, Dr. Hines and I were talking about it today as we were going around with the posters. You thought to yourself 25, 30 years ago, and the, the enthusiasm these young people were presenting when they were presenting their poster and the, uh, the sophistication of the work was there was certainly beyond where uh, I, I was 30 years yeah. ago. And uh, you're, you're gonna be the ones that get uh, R01s in the single digits. Uh, and I was, I was lucky to get into the double digits and I still got funded. So it's a, it's, it's a different time. But it's requiring a different type of skill set, and I think that we're we're adapting our our activities to 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 meet the the requirements uh, uh, that well to meet the our obligations and responsibilities to these students. I'm going to um, just deviate into the audience and ask Jeff um, Hoffman the uh, question. You've been both in NASA as a user of people as an astronaut as well, and now you're at MIT. Do you find that that um, bridge between uh, the academia and the users, the employers, is a good one? Well established? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the bridge. There's certainly, um, may, maybe you can ask the question a little differently. differently so I know what you're asking me to respond to. Uh, what, what I'm driving at is the following, that um, NASA and the space sector have needs for people who've developed a certain level of knowledge and a certain level of skill. Uh, you have at MIT a number of probably the best students um, who um, come along. Um, are you finding that uh, what you're able to add to their capabilities is allowing them to find good jobs um, in the sector. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I have to say, you know, you, you talk about your best students are not finding jobs and are leaving. We, we don't find that. I mean, I, I, at, at MIT, we, we do get the best and the brightest, and, and they're, they're finding jobs um, in the aerospace industry. Um, so I don't, you know, from, from where we're sitting, it's not a crisis situation. I don't know what the situation is throughout the educational establishment, but um, 
they're, they're clearly, and, and again, I'm, I'm in the aerospace engineer, you know, aeronautics and astronautics department, so we, we don't get a typical cross-section of students. All of our students are really excited about aerospace. They're, they want to go out and work for NASA or actually even more so nowadays for the private space industry. Uh, and and uh, we keep touch with the industry, with the users, with the people who employ our students to make sure that they're getting the right education. We try to uh, have them work on projects in teams so that they, before they leave, they actually get the sort of experience uh, in doing the sorts of things that they'll have to do when they get out into industry or, or into the government. And the feedback that, that we're getting is, I think, quite positive. Uh, as I say, we, we, we're you know, at one end of the spectrum, uh, but the situation from where we're sitting uh, still looks pretty good. Uh, very different from a lot of, we, we also have a lot of international students and of course that's a lot more problematic for international students to move into the aerospace industry. So if you have a, you know, a Chinese student is going to have a hard time getting a job with Boeing or Lockheed just because of uh, ITAR and security clearances and, and the whole thing. So I'm not surprised that a lot of them are starting to go back to China where there are more opportunities. Thank you, Jeff. Mike, you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the MIT is such a, a, a great, unique place. As I was lucky enough to be a grad student there, and Shep, you were as well, yeah, and you know, probably a few more of us here. And, and if you're interested in space and you go to MIT, you, you know, you, there's some great, you got Larry Young there if you want to talk about uh, going knock on his door like I did when I was a student and find out about his flight experiments and Chuck as well and, and all these, these great resources and his People coming to visit, like you know, uh, alumni astronauts would come and tell you about their space flight. So if you had an interest in space and you went to MIT, or if you didn't have an interest in space and you went to MIT, I'm sure you probably attract a lot of those students. And with the courses you teach, Jeff, that you've been telling me about, you know, they, it attracts a lot of the students who maybe didn't show. It's a fair to say maybe they didn't come with a space interest, but developed it when they showed up at MIT. You a good recruiting tool that that you have in the department, is that fair? Okay, so I, I don't think it's that way at other schools. Uh, my undergraduate university, uh, Columbia is a great school, but didn't have very much in, in the way of, of, uh, of uh, space-related education or projects. And um, a lot of my classmates that I went to school with uh, ended up becoming you know, stockbrokers and lawyers and other you know, productive, make a hell of a lot more than I do, actually. I've got to stay away from the union. I can't afford to go out to dinner with these guys. So, but. but um, <coughs> But there's not that presence of the space program like there was at a place like MIT. And if there was a way, but I think there's a desire. You know, hanging around the campus here at Rice, the students are interested in, in the space program and, and uh, you know, they, they're, you know they've, we've just tried to revitalize the Space Institute here. And the students are very, very interested in it. it, it it's not for a lack of hunger, I don't think. It's just that there's not the same type of uh, resources available to them like there is at a place like MIT. I, I mean, I know you can't replicate that everywhere, but if there's a way to, to inject more space program into the universities so that the, the students that are interested can participate more, I, I, I think that would, be a, you know, that would be a step in the right direction. At, at NASA, we, we, there seems to be an emphasis on, on the younger kids, you know, going to, going to speak to the elementary schools and so on. I think that's important to plant the seeds, but I, I, I just get the sense that in in a lot of the universities, we're losing the students that would be interested in a space-related career. They somehow get maybe derailed from that because there's not that presence of the space program at the university level like there is at uh, places like MIT. Thank you, Mike. Barbara, you wanted to. So I'll maybe share from the other side of the perspective, which is uh, being at a state university that's known for its blue turf football field <laughs> and a good football team. But um, you know, we, don't, we, don't have, we do not have a NASA center in the state. Our closest center is NASA <coughs> Ames Research Center. And we also have a lot of students who, who come from families who did not go to college. So but we have great opportunities there because we're able to take <coughs> advantage of 
NASA and other opportunities that allow children, whether they're very young or whether they're college students, to engage in the joy of exploration and discovery. So the um, program that um, Bill Gerstenmeier talked about earlier, the SPHERES program, is something that our students get involved in. The NASA Microgravity University is something that our students get involved in. And these students who had dreams when they were really little about uh, being an astronaut or whatever and then lost that dream because they didn't see that opportunity come to our university and they get engaged in great projects like this. And um, they are now working as engineers on the Mars Science Lab, as um, engineers for Moon X working on the uh, first, tele first commercial telescope to go on the moon, they hope anyway. Uh, working at um, Ellington um, with our Aircraft Operations Division doing research on T-38 planes. Working at Wiley Labs, uh, helping to develop some of the biomedical uh, apparatus on International Space Station. Going to Texas A&M for uh, PhDs in propulsion. Going to uh, University of Arizona for PhDs in electrical uh, power systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason is because we've got the opportunities. And so my, my hope and desire is that um, our federal agencies, whether they're here in this country or other countries, will continue providing these opportunities. They, they are there. And if they, if they go away, they won't be there. Thank Obvious you. Statement. Um, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, so um, just picking up on the idea of opportunities, uh, certainly within the universities at the uh, undergraduate and graduate postdoctoral level, uh, there are points that have already been raised. What I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about is in the, in the preparation on the medical side, since this is a space medicine summit, that one of the things that I've been involved with for the last number of years uh, has to do with undergraduate medical education and the introduction of a space medicine track at Baylor College of Medicine where students take uh, didactic lectures as an elective uh, during their first two years of undergraduate medical education. Uh, they then participate in a journal club and then have a, a research opportunity. And if they stay in this track for all four years when they graduate with their MD, they actually get a certificate in space medicine. And uh, to give you an idea of how this is growing, uh, Alex Garbino, who unfortunately could not be on this panel, although he was scheduled to be, was the very first graduate of the track. The track completed last year. Uh, he's now in the surgical ICU, and that's the reason that he couldn't be here. On Tuesday, we have three individuals who will graduate with their MD uh, from the space medicine track. In the spring course of the first year, we had 81 students, undergraduate medical students, take the space medicine track. It's almost half of the first year class it's now pretty much the most popular elective on campus. And so when we look at you know, the interest, uh, one of the points uh, that uh, we were to, uh, to talk about really re has to do with space as a catalyst of learning. We're seeing this uh, incredible excitement at the undergraduate medical side. And then I look at the audience, I see Richard Jennings, who uh, for many years was the residency uh, program Director of Aerospace Medicine Residency at UTMB where NSBRI uh, gave an award and created the Space Medicine Clinical Research Training Program and we felt that this was very important uh, at the postgraduate medical level because most residency programs these days afford uh, specialty physicians who are in training the opportunity to spend time in research and we wanted to make sure that NSBRI uh, and on behalf of NASA uh, was supporting the research opportunities to train uh, the best possible flight surgeons uh, for the future who have a nice balance of clinical and research experience in space medicine. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Bogomolov, uh, how is it in Russia? I have to say, 
that in Russia, space-related education is having several directions. First of all, this is the very beginning, working with the children, with kindergarten students even. Uh, this is a very interesting activity, and here we embrace not only uh, Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, Rostov, or other big cities, but also provincial cities. We have uh, um, contests, say, for the best drawing concerning space. Usually it has to do with certain anniversaries, such as the Cosmonautics Day, uh, 12th of April. Um, and we get a lot of uh, interesting projects and um, drawings, paintings from the kids. Uh, in Moscow, in the Institute of Medical and Biological Problems and in uh, GCTC, Cosmonaut Training Facility, we have uh, specialized departments that work with children. Uh, they familiarize them with uh, what is available. They can meet with cosmonauts, and we show them uh, not only information on manned flights, but we also show them experiments with uh, animals. Um, and besides, uh, students participate in those contests that they have to do with uh, possibly being selected for to be carried out on ISS. And we did have such experiments with butterflies, with bugs. Uh, uh, when you look at those happy faces, uh, this is, this is a level of satisfaction is so inspiring. Uh, you, you, you really get overfilled with joy. Uh, as to uh, higher, um, I mean, older students, um, uh, I'm talking about university students. Uh, in uh, the university, we have uh, medical and biological uh, department where our specialists from our institute read lectures. Uh, but that's not the only thing. We also work with a number of technical universities, uh, Moscow Aviation Institute, uh, where they also uh, teach physics and such. So, Many of those people actually are interested in uh, space-related subjects, and uh, we try to encourage all this. Uh, but there is also a problem, and I'm concerned with it. Um, the fact is that young people try to enter uh, space science that will be most interesting for them. This is biology, molecular physiology. And we have a deficit of medical personnel because uh, the structure of preparing physicians, physicians, um, uh, say flight surgeons, is not effective enough. We're kind of getting just medical, just medical specialists. It's really hard to switch them, to reroute them to particularly space medicine. So we have a deficit in that. But in the Institute of Medical and Biological Problems, we have a department for uh, doctoral degrees. We uh, usually get uh, new 10 to 15 people every every year, and uh, uh, they are working on their doctorates. Uh, every year, we have a couple of uh, conferences for young scientists and uh, specialists from other institutes usually are invited there and they come over and read their speeches. Uh, usually they um, talk about quite interesting inventions. And I would say that contemporary uh, young people are quite different from our generation. Uh, their mentality is different. Their ambitions are different. Uh, and uh, they, they s uh, criticize more. They, they 
speak more freely, they think more freely. This is all very positive. Uh, I have to say that uh, we keep working with uh, young people, yet uh, the angle, the tendency is towards more um, application of uh, some kind of skills for uh, cosmonautics, but we do not have enough doctors, and we have less and less physicians that are specializing in space, and we are concerned with that also. We had an open contest for cosmonauts where people were applying to become cosmonauts and at the cosmonaut training center Vladimir Ivanovich and myself were participating in that selection process. Uh, they need to be healthy, they need to be educated, they need to be knowledgeable, they need to be motivated, no foreign language, uh, all of that. And uh, we selected um, eight or maybe nine people and right now, uh, and they were selected from the large base. Right now, those uh, eight or nine are undergoing basic uh, training for becoming cosmos. Unfortunately, all these ca candidates, none of them is uh, a student of a medical or biological department. They either pilots, or maybe they come up from other profession, they could be engineers, so they still have to learn uh, uh, anything space-related and then maybe some aspects of uh, being a medical specialist to an extent. I personally do not uh, deal much with education, but this is, I'm telling you what I know. Uh, Igor Ivanovich Ushakov is uh, the lead of uh, space uh, medicine, uh, in, uh, and uh, so he can probably tell more. Also, there are other centers in the federal agency. So there is something is happening on. The work is ongoing. And however, uh, we are lacking uh, funds. We need some additional budgets, and also uh, the administration of the Russian Space Agency is mostly concerned with the issues of uh, today. They are not looking into the future as much as I believe they should. And this is my pain, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Okay, Larry Young over there. First of all, on the behalf of the several of the educators in the room, I want to express our, grat our gratitude, especially to the National Space Biomedical Research Institute for supporting the, pro the programs at the, at the graduate level, postdoctoral level, level, and so forth. And I'll, I'll ask my colleague from Texas A&M to, to say a few words a afterwards. But look, I'd like you to think back to when we were all students and why we decided to go into science or engineering or medicine, uh, you know, to go back to the words of President Kennedy on this, on this campus, we did it not because it was easy, but because it was hard. We did it because it was challenging. And if there's one thing that space is, is challenging. It's exciting, it's fun, it's hard, and it's a matter of great pride when you know that a piece of, ex a piece of scientific work or experiment that you worked on is in orbit and you are seeing the data coming down through the, through the uh, center at, uh, at Johnson or at Huntsville or something, that's a tremendous kick. And you know, my, my classmates who went, in, went to Wall Street make more money than I do, but they're all jealous of what I do. You know, and I think we probably can express that. And we can build on that. We can build on it and tell the students, that, yes, you will get a job. You may, have, may not be your first choice, but you will get a job. You will work in, the, uh, uh, in this field, and the re rewards are well, well, well worth it. And you know what we can't replace is the passion. I mean, that if we if 
if the students are able to share the kind of sense of passion that we've been hearing about for two days, we know so, know so well, the good ones will stick with it, and the bad ones should go and do something else. <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> now, uh, Carl, sitting in, the, sitting in the back are a number of great students, both yeah. mine and, uh, uh, and others, as well as Bill Shepard, who wasn't bad either. Uh, <laughs> maybe, perhaps one, one or more of them would like to comment it from, from he, the He comments. merges in very well. Right. <laughs> but, for, but first, let, let, may I pass the microphone to uh, Professor Bloomfield? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Sue Bloomfield from Texas A&M and associated with our um, NSBRI funded pre-doctoral training program. And I just wanted to point out that sometimes an investment um, has unintended or um, unplanned for spin-offs. Uh, because, you know, the program itself funds at our institution two f new fellows each year. All right, that doesn't sound like very many. They're supported for two years, and so we have a cadre built up of maybe six to eight that are in residence at any one time. However, the presence of those excited students in our labs and in our programs attracts other students who can also attend the seminars and classes that we're offering specific to the program. Some of those students have n are now applying for summer internships at NASA, have gotten excited about this, and start on their own track, even if they're not formally one of our fellows. I've had three students in the last five years finish undergraduate honors theses in my lab because they wanted to work with my graduate students in this fun, exciting area. So it, it, it snowballs and it has um, much more impact than I think we realize um, just from this, the numbers of fellows we have formally enrolled in the program. So it attracts some of the very best students um, they know they have to work hard, but you know the passion is there and that fuels them. And it, and it sure is um, fun for us faculty to work with them as well. So it's a, it's a dynamic process. They get to interact with great colleagues at JSC. It builds research collaborations among the faculty. Um, I got involved in radiation-related research and never <laughs> expected to be collaborating with radiation biologists. So it, 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 it um, um, stimulates that interaction among the faculty, among faculty with JSC people. It's been, you know, it's had amazing um, consequences I in the broad educational sense, even for us older professors. <laughs> Thanks. I, I okay. just want to <coughs> add on this the This will have to be the last comment on the education part because I also want to spend time on the outreach. I just wanted to add a comment yeah. that, I mean, I, Susan has, is at one university, but I had, um, NASA-related grants, and I had 10 students from different universities graduate with PhD on a NASA-related project. Thanks to NSPRI, I had grants, so I spun off some of my grant money to them, and that way I had, I had an NIH grant, so I spun off some of my NIH money. So we had nine students that received PhDs from different University of Oklahoma, University of Michigan, University of Houston, Texas Southern University, and Texas A&M. All of them worked on NASA-related projects. I think it's just how you motivate them. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, move the conversation now to the public outreach side of things. Um, in the past probably five years, there's been a fundamental shift in communications. The social media has become incredibly important. And being skilled with the social media wins elections. What that really means is that social media is a way of getting support, getting votes. So one of the questions that I have of um, our panel members is, are we using these new tools of outreach that are becoming all pervasive throughout um, the world, um, which is well connected by internet, are we using them well enough in space, or are we just sticking to the traditional means of outreach, which is well constructed, well thought out, small target type of um, activity? So who'd like to um, take that from the panel? Mike. Uh, well, you, uh, anyone know that Chris Hatfield just come back from space? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, 
the, the, the way that he was able to reach out through the social media. Is it just in my house or does everyone know about this? Because I remember my, kid, my son who, even though we're a NASA family and you know, guys like Dan Burbank show up at the front door, you know, he's, he's interested in the space program, but you know, they don't, it doesn't really catch his attention as much as a lot of other things. He's 17. And on Saturday, Sunday evening, this is, this is how I, I base my, you know, my it's a one data point, my own kids. That's good. But he, he says, hey, Dad, take a look at this. And it was Sunday night, and it was about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And he says, look at this, look what, look what, uh, look what Hatfield's doing. And he, it was this David Bowie space odyssey. Has anyone seen this, this come out? And uh, it was you know, him singing. Have you seen it? Has yeah. anyone seen this thing? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen this? Okay, all right, go ahead. So, uh, so I go, so, so I go, has, it, has it gone viral, viral yet? And he goes, it probably will be because it's on Reddit. I don't know what Reddit is, but apparently it's a good <laughs> thing to be on. So, um, so sure enough, I mean, and then, the sun, and then Monday morning, I turn on the CBS Morning News, the national news program, and they're talking about Hatfield and space. And then he said, oh, by the way, they also did an emergency spacewalk over the weekend. But that was like an afterthought. <laughs> but mainly was Hatfield, how much they love Hatfield with his, with his singing to David Bowie. This is, this is what happened. Okay, okay. And, <coughs> and apparently, excuse me, apparently the other news programs had it too. I guess ABC, all of them covered it. And then uh, I, you know, luck, lucky enough, we get to see these guys when they come back soon after and I saw Chris and says, Man, you know, you, you know what's going on here. And he goes, yeah, and, and all of it, he had a lot of support to do that. Okay, so with his tweets that also were very popular that I would see quoted on the news programs, uh, his son helped him out. He had a son who was able to, very savvy, younger guy, you know, in his, I guess, mid-20s or so, was savvy with the computers. And so Chris would send down a, his picture, just like all astronauts do. Dan, you probably sent down a couple million, right? No, seriously, right? You said, but you guys take a lot of photos up there, right? And so, okay, so, so they, but the difference I think with Chris maybe was is that he had help. You know, he had someone to, because you're busy in space, you don't have time to do that. You want to tweet, but you don't have that much time. It's not a priority necessarily. But he was able to shift these photos down maybe with a message. And then his son did the research. He was telling me that Evan looked into, like it was a picture of Ireland or something. He looked into the different towns that were in the image and he would tell a little bit about the history of the towns, put that out there, would contact the newspaper, the local papers in that town in, in, in Ireland. And then Chris said, he gave me that as an example. That was like one of the first places they hit. And then his number of followers on Twitter went up by 20,000 as a result of that, for example. And that all of these, these and he said these towns want to see a picture of themselves from space about once a week, is what he said. Now, does, astronauts can't keep up with all that, but the support he had was able, was, was able to put that message out. Um, and then with these music videos that he did, if you've seen that thing, I asked him about that, and it was he had a c connection with someone who used to play with David Bowie, and, and you know, they were able to orchestrate the music and produce it like it was a real music video and get that out there on whatever the, the right channel was. So I think we have the greatest example of how you could use yeah. a social media. Now, you might say it's a lot of fun and games, but at the same point, it attracts people's attention, so then they'll pay attention to what he's doing. And they'll see Chris for what he is. He's a, a, a terrific astronaut and a great role model and a good guy. They'll learn about that. And they'll learn about the experiments he did and the research he conducted. And, and it's all related. But he able, was able to do that. And I think he was the personality to do it. He had the interest in doing it. But he also had a good support structure on the ground. It wasn't just like, you know, send me your tweets or you know, tweet on your own. And it's like an, an extra chore for him. I think he had enough support that it, that it works. So I think that's the best example we've had of being able to utilize that stuff. So, so would you um, recommend that every agency start getting some experts in social media to support crews getting the message out? I think you just need young kids. I don't even know if, you know, you need some young kids. I mean, we have a lot of experts that, you know, like, you know, I'm trying to, if I would have learned how to try to do it, you know, and I have, I tweet, I, I was, I was actually the first guy to tweet from space, kind of, sort of, but I didn't, I, I sent it down to PAO and they, they put it out there. So I have a lot of, relatively speaking, a lot of Twitter followers. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question again? Uh, you were <laughs> you're talking about, should every agency do this? I think you should get these kids. I mean, because like, you know, Chris's kid, I don't think was necessarily a, uh, a, uh, a, you know, a public affairs person. He was just a kid that understood that media. My, yeah. my son is a 17 year old that, un that you know, understands how that works. I think we should get a bunch of kids that are interested in doing that stuff yeah, and sick them on it. 
And I think it's hard. It's harder for us who are, you know, who don't understand it, or you know, I think it's, you know, what are you kidding me? Someone's going to read it, but they, they they do it. I think it's a great way to reach the young people, and even this, you know, in the spur in the house, you know, in my house, if you have a young person around, you'll hear about it. And I saw his video when it first came out, you know, and I thought it was great. And and uh, so I think you need, you know, I, I'm, I'm I'm kind of being serious. I, I think you should hire a bunch of these young interns that have this energy, understand how they communicate over. You know, Facebook and all these other things, and sick him on it because you have the greatest topic in the world. I mean, his video, it's, it's stuff that we've been doing, we haven't been singing like him, but you know, a lot of stuff he did, like, you know, ringing out the, the towel in space, got a few million hits on it, and, and his, his uh, all of his, his stuff is, you know, it's, it's great. It's because it's in space, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he's floating around, the guitar floating, and whatever else he's showing. You know that that is just a really good subject matter, but you need to you need somebody who understands how to get that stuff out there. So I think we should send the army of kids at it and get people's attention, like Chris has done, and then can teach them about all the serious stuff that everyone's talking about in the other sessions. So yeah, and I'll, so. I'll add a little bit to this that the um, information that Chris was sending down got the news agencies, the TV channels, they were looking forward to the next one, and it was going in just about every news broadcast. And when Chris came down, the Prime Minister phoned and made a statement in the House saying what a great role model Chris Hatfield was. Yeah. So, so, you know, right, right there, just by this one means, he was able to reach the complete spectrum of our, the Canadian society, mm. from the young through to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah. And the Queen. Good, uh, the Queen. Oh, I, don't, I don't know about the Queen. She... No, the Queen, too. The Queen called her. Called him and congratulated him. Oh, I, d I hadn't even heard that. Well, that's great. <laughs> well, Pretty we've good. had similar experiences, and, I, and we learned the hard way as well. We've had some, a number of flights, like our, our, our colleagues in Russia on ISS, uh, focusing on different experiments, plants, uh, butterflies, spiders. We're going to be flying ants this fall. And it, uh, it's a, it was interesting about how do you draw traffic and eyes and the media to this. Mm -hmm. And we would just say, so you just can't put it up on a website and expect people to come, but immediately when you start using YouTube, Don Pettit, by the way, yesterday, would, he was here, he's phenomenal. If you, if just, uh, sometime just Google Don Pettit and Saturday Morning Science, and there's about 20 videos that he's done up there that are just fantastic about how to use science and how he well explains it. Uh, and so we, it, it, that's worthwhile. But our experience was, when we first did this, we spent a, we spent a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money from NSBRI to try and put something up, and we weren't getting much traffic, and then all of a sudden somebody said, well, why don't uh, you uh, text people? Well, how do you, well, first off, I didn't know how to text. I said, well, so we found some young person. He texted within his network and within their network and geometric they grew. So all of a sudden we had 500,000 people watching caterpillars on somebody's desk uh, crawl around to the point that it almost shut down Baylor's IT system. And so they, 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 they were a little concerned about that, but how fast that happened in about a 48 hour period. So it was, a, we, so we've been using it successfully for dissemination of information. Students don't email anymore, they text. Mm -hmm. So one way of keeping in touch with our students is we text them. We don't, we don't e email them anymore. Emails for us old guys is might be the only way to communicate, but young people don't email. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're missing something bigger here, and I wanted to bring it up in the last segment of this, but uh, I believe that the virtual media is really going to be a disruptive element for good in the educational process, and it's doing the same thing now with mainstream media and uh, elements like NASA PAO, and people are wrestling with, you know, what does it mean, uh, how do we employ it, how best to use it, but this is, this is a glacier that's moving across the planet. And um, you know, we're, we're behind the curve figuring out that it's a good thing and how to leverage it. Uh, I think fundamentally academic institutions 20, maybe even 10 or five years from now are gonna look totally different because of online courses and things that are structured in the virtual environment. Uh, I work a lot in the defense and intelligence sector it is completely disruptive to have this technology in those arenas because you have people at a very low level who know as much as the generals do, and that is incredibly disruptive. So I think, I think, 
I think we should kind of step back from this and not worry too much about whether we're tweeting or not and, and try and put a wrench on this thing from a, a strategic point of view. Mm. Thank you. Any other panel member on the outreach side? Uh, Barbara, you had? Well, I just want to oh. echo the, the other comments. You know, we, we saw this wave uh, coming a, a number of years ago and then totally revamped uh, NSBRI's window to the world by having Twitter and Facebook and, and YouTube downloads. And to give you an idea of the extent of the power of, of YouTube, to, similar to, uh, to Chris Hatfield's um, video, was uh, in uh, one of uh, Richard's, uh, in Richard's program at UTMB, uh, John Clark is one of the, the mentors, and he had a group of the UTMB aerospace medicine residents uh, working on the Red Bull Stratus uh, project, and it's leading to about 10 scientific publications. But what they did was, uh, when Felix Baumgartner had his uh, supersonic freefall flight when he went to Mach 1.25, uh, it was picked up by YouTube and watched uh, live simultaneously by 7.1 million viewers uh, worldwide, and it was the the largest uh, uh, YouTube uh, video that was shown in terms of the number of uh, simultaneous viewers. But there is an example of, of there was essentially, uh, um, you know, an aerospace medicine <laughs> event uh, that was uh, that was being broadcast live, and it was it was really incredible. Yeah, that was the number one uh, viewed video. But number three was Don Pettit and Angry Birds. <laughs> Seriously, he was number three. 119, 119 million views. Where is Don? He's in the garage <laughs> fixing something. But he had 119 million views with this Angry Bird thing, which is, Dan, you know about this, right? Didn't you have them floating around when you were up there? So, so they had, you know, that was number three, but Felix was number one, but, you know. Let me just ask a question. Uh, uh, do any of you know the TED series, T-E-D? Yes. Yeah. They're normally interviews of people who've got energy, ideas, and they have a huge following, and they're posted on YouTube after they've been interviewed. Um, is that a vehicle that uh, we should be getting our best and brightest and uh, most capable communicators to use more because that resides and it stays and it keeps on getting looked up and it's cataloged. Right. Well, um, I mean, certainly, and and in fact, uh, a number of the ISMS participants, uh, John Clark and Scott Dolshevsky and a few others, have done these TED lectures and have, you know, packed the house and had standing ovations. And I'm sure others on the, you know, mm -hmm. have done that as well. So, I think they're great. Hi, uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit on, on Bill, Bill Shepard's comments and tie them together with exactly what you ask here, Carl. Uh, there's a huge move in that direction, at least in the medical schools and in, me in the medical science areas. Um, we are uh, uh, turning things upside down. For those of you who don't know me, I'm with the Association of American Medical Colleges. And we are literally turning things upside down using those kinds of approaches. And not only the TED Med approach, but bringing it into our own meetings. A meeting like this would be run 100% different than we do here today uh, if it were a medical, uh, if it were led by the Association of American Medical Colleges. Speakers would be allowed, if you, if you had a visiting professor who came, they'd be given, we would encourage this, not everybody follows it, but they'd be given uh, 15 minutes and five slides, and the rest of it would be dialogue back and forth uh, with the audience. Uh, the whole approach that way has just been revitalized. Uh, I, think, I think the whole world is gonna be exposed to to uh, the Larry Youngs and the Jeff Hoffmans and, and, uh, and uh, other members, you know, from, uh, hmm? uh, you know, uh, Chuck Omens, et cetera, from that we were talking about earlier. I mean, is Coursera now 105,000 students on these courses? Uh, we just had a recent discussion that I was in about teaching biochemistry in medical school. Now this involved 
a dozen people talking about it and saying how many professors are we going to need in our medical schools to teach, to teach biochemistry, not to do the research, but to teach biochemistry. And one wag in the group said, three for the nation. That was, that's probably an overstatement, but it started about how many would you need in a medical school to actually teach it. And uh, I, think, I think it's a revolution, and we really need to be a part of it in our educational programs uh, in order to stimulate the, the audience that we want to attract. Но я бы сказал, что если мы бы сделали открытый наш симпозиум, то при четверти мы бы здесь бы не говорили. I think if we open the summit uh, initially, probably it would open it differently. We would probably uh, talk about problems mostly. I think the problems or issues should not be uh, should not be broadcasted over social networks, uh, and also uh, outreach is. Uh, uh, it is probably uh, can probably cause problems because uh, um, media usually loves uh, scandals, loves when something goes wrong, and this is something it comes out first. Unfortunately, achievements or interesting things that occur, uh, such as. Uh, um, uh, competitions, uh, contests for young people. This is usually of interest to quite a narrow audience, and I think this is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give the last word to one of the young people who had posters on education or outreach. Any takers? So I think, so I, I know what Reddit is, <laughs> and I think uh, Jordan does as well, and I think yeah, these social media kind of ways of outreach are incredibly useful. Oh yeah, uh, I think these, uh, the social media is very useful, but we shouldn't forget the, uh, the personal interaction. I know that um, some, of, uh, some of our professors really encourage us to go and do outreach in the more traditional way, and you can reach students. Um, I mean, you know, when someone watches a YouTube video, they're like, yeah, that's pretty cool, and then they go and watch the next YouTube video. But if you're talking with students or engaging them or giving them some way to follow up with what you're telling them, that's how you're going to keep their interest, so. Okay, thank you very much, then. Um, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, I appreciate the inputs from everybody, but let me uh, try and summar uh, summarize, first of all, um, what I heard. Um, on the education side, I must say we did have a sort of predominance of um, what I would call US-centric views, um, just by virtue of the uh, makeup of the uh, panel. Um, but we did have a very good intervention also um, from Russia. And it's clear that we can no longer assume that the education system is going to go and provide all the people that we need. There needs to be more interaction, I think, between the eventual um, employers of the products of those students um, with the universities to make sure that things are well meshed. And at the same time, I think coming around to the other end, uh, the public outreach um, side of things, it's clear there's huge potential for us to do better, to get more support, and that, of course, will close that loop so that at the end of the day, the two bookends for space activity will allow positive momentum to grow. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, panel members.